What's going on, everybody? Welcome on in to the Matt Lombardo Show presented by Heavy Sports. I'm heavy on sports NFL insider Matt Lombardo. Great to have you here. Super Wild Card Weekend is in the rearview window, and what a weekend it was. You talk about some crazy games going down to the wire. What we saw on Sunday night in Cincinnati, the insane play, the Sam Hubbard 98-yard fumble return for a touchdown. Monday night, Tom Brady's season comes to a careening end against the Dallas. Cowboys and you had a tight game in Minnesota with the Giants advancing and all kinds of great games throughout the weekend. We're going to get into all of that, preview the divisional round, which is going to look a lot different than any divisional round that we've seen over the past decade. We'll get into the NFL offseason and some of the biggest storylines to come with ESPN NFL analyst Mina Kimes. And a whole lot more. But as always, before we get into it, just a little bit of housekeeping for you. If you enjoy the podcast, please go ahead and subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store, Spotify, SoundCloud, Spreaker, all of your favorite podcast platforms. Toss us a like on YouTube. And if you do listen in Apple Podcasts, please go ahead. It would mean a lot. We'd really appreciate it if you went into the Apple Podcast Store and left it a five-star review. Let us know what you like about the podcast, what you don't like, maybe a guest or two you'd like to hear from. We'll go try to bring them on. But those five-star reviews, they really do help help grow the show. And we mentioned how this NFL divisional round is going to look so much different than any that we've seen over the past decade. And that's because for the first time with Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers not qualifying for the postseason, their season ending in that Sunday night week 18 loss to the division rival Detroit Lions and Tom Brady really throwing a dud out there against the Dallas Cowboys, the Buccaneers getting blown out on Monday night on their home field. This is now the first time since 2010 that neither Tom Brady nor Aaron Rodgers will be in the divisional round. And you think about the quarterbacks who are still alive, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Dak Prescott. These are all the next group of young quarterbacks. These are all the new standard bearers of quarterbacks, of elite quarterback play across the NFL, and all of their teams very much still in the mix for a Super Bowl title this year. So who has the best chance of moving forward? Who are the team's best positioned to continue building to take that next step in 2023 and beyond? And who are the more attractive, the most attractive head coaching destinations for the Sean Paytons and the Ben Johnsons and some of the top coordinators, the D'Amico Ryans is out there. We're going to get into all of that and a whole lot more right now with ESPN NFL analyst Mina Kimes. Really excited for this conversation. One of the brightest football minds out there. No one better to talk about the NFL offseason, preview the postseason. She joins us on behalf of ESPN and Sling TV. She's ESPN NFL analyst Mina Kimes. Mina, thanks for taking the time today. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course. And, you know, right out of the shoot, I'd love to get your thoughts on the head coaching vacancies around the league. Because when I look at these openings, Houston, ownership kind of, I don't want to say instability, but impatience, no real clear solution at quarterback. Denver, you're dealing with Russell Wilson, where Father Time kind of caught up to him. And, of course, Indianapolis quarterback carousel every single year and Jim Irsay has to be difficult to work with. When you look at these openings, what would be the most attractive of the bunch, in your opinion? Well, I personally think Carolina is actually the best job. Um, interim Steve, interim head coach Steve Wilkes, I thought, did an excellent job, and I'm sure he'll be up for consideration. But that is an open position. And I like it because I think the roster is in good shape, um, despite the fact that there's still a question mark at quarterback. I think they've made some real improvements on that offensive line, part of the reason why they were able to win as many games as they did. And they have a lot of young talent on defense. Now, of course, if you were to take that job, you are, uh, you know, taking a job where it is unclear who's going to be under center. And I think that's mission number one. It's a little bit daunting because, as you alluded to, a lot of those open jobs and a lot of teams around the NFL right now need quarterbacks. But as far as like a roster that's in good shape for the next quarterback, it reminds me almost of the Detroit Lions where I look at them and I feel like, OK, they're building things the right way. For sure. And you have to give Dan Campbell a lot of credit for what he was able to build from a culture standpoint. We saw that really shine through in the season finale against the Packers. Are any of these teams you think that close from a talent standpoint where somebody could come in? Carolina, I think, is a great one because of the way they finished with the running game, very similar to Detroit. But outside of the Panthers, do you see a team that could make that sort of jump with the right hire? Well, it's kind of frustrating for Denver because technically that would be my answer. I think they've got right. the best team top to bottom. The defense is one of the best in the NFL. 
we'll see what happens with their defensive coordinator, Giro Evero, is a, a hot ticket uh, for head coaching interviews as well. But the question, of course, is whether or not uh, the new head coach can get Russell Wilson to, if not return to you know the elite form he had in Seattle, at least improve upon what we saw this year, which was pretty pretty bad. So uh, whoever takes that job will do so either with the intention of rehabilitating Russell Wilson's career, or I would have to say an explicit understanding that after one year with Wilson, they'll have the opportunity to move on when it becomes a little bit more feasible from a financial perspective. And Jim Harbaugh is one of the biggest fish out there. And you hear some people linking him to the Denver Broncos. We've heard his name tossed into the fray with the Indianapolis Colts. Where's the best fit for Jim Harbaugh? And do you think that this is the year, given the recent allegations levied by the NCAA against the University of Michigan, do you think that this is the year that he makes (laughs) the leap back into the NFL? Well, it was interesting because those allegations were reported right after Harbaugh, in conjunction with Michigan, put out a statement saying he planned. No one knows what the future will hold, but I expect to be in Michigan. I might be getting the wording wrong. There's definitely a little bit of an out there. And of course, he's kind of had a will they won't they thing with the NFL for several years now. So I can't say for sure what the future will hold for him. I can say, though, that the NFL interest is real um, and that, you know, he is. Uh, involved in talks. Obviously, it's been reported for some of those opportunities. Indianapolis does make a lot of sense to me. Um, You know, Harbaugh is one of the very few guys to go from the college level to the NFL and actually have success there in San Francisco, of course. And I have to think that's what makes them stand out as opposed to other college candidates for NFL teams, given that most college coaches that have gone to the NFL in recent years haven't been successful. And what do you make of Sean Payton? Because obviously I think he has, by even his own accord, a decent situation at Fox. And he's even said that he's left the door open to staying in TV for another year. But you have to think, take the compensation off the table. He'd have to be the most attractive name out there for any owner or GM as a head coach, given his track record with the Saints, the Super Bowl win. Where's his best fit? Where do you think that he winds up? First, I'll say I agree with you 100%. I think he is the most attractive candidate. Um, For me, you know, in large part, not just because the success with New Orleans, highest scoring head coach team pairing in NFL history, seven division titles. Really, though, what stands out to me is the end of Drew Brees' career when he was really on the decline in terms of performance, but Sean Payton was still able to keep winning games. The fact that he went 5-0 with Teddy Bridgewater as the quarterback in New Orleans, I think regardless of whether you're a team that has a quarterback or a team that like some of the ones we've discussed is in the market for a quarterback or will be drafting one, his track record when it comes to calling an offense is so appealing. Now, because of that, he really has his pick of teams. And, you know, I said Carolina is the most desirable, but the truth is none of these jobs are super desirable because otherwise it would be open. And that makes me wonder if Peyton um, might even consider waiting a year Uh, I don't know if any of these jobs are appealing enough for him to return to the NFL. He's been linked to Arizona because of, you know, in part because of what they've interviewed him, but also positive comments he made about Kyler Murray in the past. But he is going to be pretty um, judicious when it comes to picking his next spot. And I could see him returning, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he gives it a little more time. And on the surface, Denver, I feel like, would make some sense there because, you know, he has the experience with Drew Brees. And as you said, it was almost a renaissance for Teddy Bridgewater when he had him for that year as the starter. I almost wonder if we start talking about coaches who could resurrect Russell Wilson or build an offense around Russell Wilson, if Sean Payton doesn't kind of jump to the top of that hierarchy. But kind of the caveat to that is you don't know if that's going to work. And you're in a division with Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, and whatever the Raiders wind up doing at quarterback with all of that talent on both sides of the ball too. Yeah, and I should have said that's a big part of the reason also why I think the Carolina job is desirable because yeah. you coach in the NFC South, um, as opposed to the AFC West, which, of course, you know, yeah, you've got to face those quarterbacks in Kansas City and L.A. We should know, you know, when we talk about these jobs and their appeal to coaches, there's also the business side of it. And I think that's going to factor into uh, some of these decision making processes as well for some of these coaching candidates, and especially like a Peyton. Um, Denver Bron- Broncos are under new ownership. Um, uh, connection to Walmart, one of the biggest country companies in the world, mostly countries. Uh, so you have to think they'd be able to put together something pretty attractive for Peyton. 
And I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your Seahawks because I know you're a huge Seattle fan. And, you know, you look at their season. Geno Smith has kind of been operating on the fringes of the MVP conversation through the whole year. And I don't know that anybody expected him to have this kind of success in year one with Pete Carroll as the starter. What do you make of his season? And and if you were grading Geno Smith's 2022 campaign, how would you grade him out? I mean, you have to give him at least an A minus, certainly when you consider expectations coming into this year uh, and the fact that he surpassed them in just about every possible way and is a large reason why this team is even in the playoffs, which I don't think many people projected for them, frankly. Um, You know, it's Gino in some ways has always been this quarterback. He's always been pretty accurate. He throws beautiful deep ball. Um, But in the past, I would say he has struggled more with decision making. Saw that pop up a little bit at the end of the year. And I think what's really surprised me watching him this year has just been the playmaking, um, his ability to create outside of the pocket, use his legs. And that's going to be paramount when they play the San Francisco 49ers because Seattle has to figure out a way to mitigate that terrifying pass rush. They sure do. And I think one of the ways that you do that is with Kenneth Walker. But before we get to him, I'm just curious, Do you have you seen enough as someone so close to that program and that team and follows them so closely? Have you seen enough from Geno Smith to make him the long-term solution moving forward? Should Seattle build around him in 2023 and beyond? I think ideally the Seahawks would strike a contract with Geno Smith. That's sort of similar to what the Titans do with Ryan Tannehill, where it's not top of the market money, but it's still uh, a fair amount. And it's, you know, a three-year contract that maybe is really two years, that kind of mid-market deal. Um, And I also think it shouldn't necessarily stop them from drafting a quarterback. Now they did fall a little bit. And so the Seahawks um, have Denver's draft pick, which ended up falling at number five. Uh, There are two quarterbacks, CJ Stroud and Bryce Young that are kind of being eyed right now as going top two. We'll see how things shake out now that Chicago has the first overall pick, but I have to think the Seahawks will give those quarterbacks and a couple others a look and consider whether or not they want to take one at five, potentially trade up. Uh, and I, I think you have to really go through that process, but that shouldn't stop you from keeping Geno Smith in the fold, especially for next season. Has he done enough to persuade you out of trading up to go and get a CJ Stroud or a Bryce Young that, that maybe you can sit there if you're not committed to him for the long term that you would feel comfortable drafting a Will Levis or drafting a weapon on either side of the ball to keep building around him? Did you see enough out of him this year to prevent you from giving up the capital to go up a couple spots? I would lean towards keeping him and using that spot whether you trade down or use that to flush out the rest of the team, frankly, and then right. maybe taking a flyer on a quarterback. I don't know, like Anthony Richardson. I got to spend a little more time with some of these college quarterbacks, honestly, but a little bit later in the draft, because while the Seahawks are in the playoffs, um, you know, it's still a pretty flawed team, especially on defense. I think that front seven could really use some help. And there's a real opportunity here, both in the draft and free agency where the Seahawks have a lot of cap space to improve on that side of the ball. Did you think Kenneth Walker would be this good out of the shoot? Uh, you know, I really liked him in college. I liked his game. And I think he's shown a lot of the qualities that we saw um, in college, which especially the explosiveness, burst, lateral movements, the balance, vision. Um, it can be a little bit uh, boomer bust for Seattle at times because of his running style, but he is a big play waiting to happen. Now, whether they should lean on that heavily against San Francisco, I actually think is... Uh, pretty much it, it's a little tricky because while you see a pass rush like that, the thought is well, we want to run the ball and use screens and try to get the ball quickly out of the quarterback's hands. San Francisco has a very, very good run defense and they didn't have a lot of success running the ball last time. I would worry about running on early downs and putting Geno Smith in second thirds and longs, but he has been absolutely fantastic for them and is rightfully a candidate for offensive rookie of the year. Now, switching gears real quick to talk quarterbacks, Derek Carr obviously is going to be available, and he posted his goodbye to Raider Nation, and the Raiders made it pretty clear that they were done, that they're going to be going in a different direction uh, this offseason. Where do you think Derek Carr ends up, and where's his best fit on the open market? I think there will be definitely a market for Derek Carr. I'll say that first. He's you know still under contract with the Raiders. Um you know, I've had people ask me, well, like, you know, he didn't play good this year. It doesn't matter. He's played, I would say, consistently at that 10 to 15, yet yeah, 10 to 15 level in terms of ranking quarterbacks over the course of his career. And there are more teams that need quarterbacks than there are quarterbacks available, um, you know, amongst 
trade candidates and free agents. You're looking at Derek Carr, Jimmy Garoppolo is a free agent, Tom Brady, you know, <laughs> Lamar Jackson would be a pipe dream for certain teams, but Carr is Aaron Rodgers maybe, maybe on the trade market as Rodgers well, or as well. maybe on the open market, depending what happens in Green Bay. Yeah, and you would that would I would tell you that would take more than it would to trade for Derek Carr for sure. or certainly yeah. more than Lamar Jackson. You'd have to put together like a godfather package to make that happen. Um, so I, I do think that he is a realistic upgrade. I think it would have to be a team that's already on the verge of contending as a, like say the New York jets. I would also throw out the Washington commanders as opposed to a team like the Texans that are still in a rebuild. But um, I'll put it this way. If the car, if the jets had had Derek Carr, I think they would be in the playoffs with that defense. And I have to think that's going to, you know, enter into their minds as they approach this off season. I think so, too. I think Carr and Garoppolo are both great options there. And I want to, you know, zoom out 30,000 feet and put you in the GM chair. Mina Kimes is running a franchise. She gets her pick of all of the quarterbacks in the postseason to build around. Who, who's your number one pick? Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> is is it, it that open and shut for you? Is it, is it, it is open and shut. He, and I mean, else? you know, all season long, there was an ongoing debate. Maybe Josh Allen should be MVP. Maybe Jalen Hurst should be MVP. Here comes Joe Burrows playing, playing great football near the end of the season. But Patrick Mahomes was the best quarterback coming into the season, and he is the best quarterback in the NFL coming out of it. it it's kind of remarkable how consistently great he's been. Honestly, this season, I think, might have been his finest season as a pro, given the fact that the Chiefs did trade away Tyreek Hill and some of the changes they were undergoing on offense. Um, he is, you know, still number one by a bullet for me and probably will be for a while. Now, of course, Mina is joining us on behalf of Sling TV. And for football fans looking for an exceptional cable-like experience at a much lower price, there's never a bad time to check out Sling, especially with the NFL playoffs just getting underway. Mina, tell us all the exciting things that are happening at Sling and what people can look forward to if they cut the cord and move to Sling. Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you how I use it, honestly, which is mostly to watch sports and being on the road a lot, I end up using my iPad a lot to watch yeah. all the ESPN channels in particular. And I was using it a lot to watch college football a lot this season as well. But um, yeah, for me, it's like not really, you know, being on the road so much and kind of not being sure always what I'll get when I'm like in a random hotel room in Tampa or whatever, <laughs> or at an airport. Um, having that reliability to watch games is pretty significant but you know i also like they have like a dvr function so i can use it to watch um to save shows when i'm especially when i'm flying i use that a lot um and you know just to catch up on things because i spend so much time during the regular season watching live sports and sling that i i don't get as much time to watch shows live as other people <laughs> and, and no contract so you can bail at any time it yes. sounds like correct. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, I like, it's how simple it is. Starts at $40 a month, obviously, but it's all right there. You can search the shows in advance to kind of see what's available, which is helpful for me in particular, but um, yeah, it's, it's just very clean and easy. She's Mina Kimes, ESPN NFL analyst and one of the brightest football minds out there. Follow her on Twitter at Mina Kimes and check out Sling TV. Mina, this has been a real treat. Really enjoyed the conversation. Look forward to talking to you further up the road. Me too. Thanks. Just fantastic. Sorry. Just fantastic stuff there from Mina Kimes. She, of course, brought to us by Sling TV and check them out. And obviously, the Seattle Seahawks are going to be a team to check out in the future. And I think even though they came up short against Brock Purdy and the 49ers, I think they're going to be a team on the rise and a team to watch because there's so much young talent there. We talked a lot about Kenneth Walker and the fact that he led all rookies in rushing, even though he only played in 11 games this year. He finished 12th in the league in rushing yards. Pretty impressive for a rookie running back who didn't play anywhere close to a full season. And I think what you saw in Santa Clara on Saturday afternoon, even though they came up short, I think Geno Smith really showed enough that he can be the kind of quarterback that you build around. He can be the franchise quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. And in a division with so much turnover now happening in Arizona, new general manager, who knows what's going to happen there at head coach. I know Monty Asinoff hired as the GM. That might take them out of the Sean Payton sweepstakes, but we'll see. We'll see where Payton lands. But I think it's going to be a difficult sell to pair Payton with a general manager. But you look at that division, the Seahawks and the Niners, 
are at the top of the list. Who knows who the 49ers quarterback is next season? Maybe they go after one of the big name veterans still available. Maybe they build around Purdy. Maybe they go back to Trey Lance once he's healthy. But I think that when you look at stability at head coach, quarterback, and you look at the job that John Robinson has done as general manager in Seattle, positioning them to take a big step forward after this year, I think the future is very bright for the Seahawks. And one team that you kind of have to question the direction right now, one team you have to kind of question just how bright the future is despite having one of the top young quarterbacks in the league, that's the Los Angeles Chargers. And again, it really feels like the Chargers are taking half measures by firing offensive coordinator Joe Lombardi and presumably keeping Brandon Staley even after Saturday night's epic collapse in Jacksonville. Look, it wasn't bad enough that the Chargers let the Jaguars came back from 27 to nothing down to lose that game. They forced five turnovers and they lost. They forced five turnovers. They had a plus five turnover margin and they lost the football game. Now, everything the Chargers do from here has to be centered around Justin Herbert's development. I mean, we're getting to the point now where we're kind of bumping up against questioning just how much longer the prime of his career is going to last. And it's kind of egregious that at this point in his career, Justin Herbert has only made the postseason one time. He's only made one playoff appearance. And a lot of that, you can look at Brandon Staley's shortcomings. You can look at what happened in that game last season against the Raiders where all it would have taken was a tie and both teams would have gotten in. You look at how they coached that game. You look at what happened on Saturday night in Jacksonville. A lot of the blame for the Chargers underachieving has to lay at the feet of Brandon Staley. And Herbert only has one playoff appearance, and kind of here we are. It's really egregious to me that when you look at what happened down the stretch, it's really egregious that Brandon Staley would have played Justin Herbert and the rest of the starters in a completely meaningless Week 18 game that saw Mike Williams go out with a back injury. That should have been it right then and there. I know they went to the postseason, but that was a fireable offense in its own right before you even get into the debacle in Duval on Saturday night. But to keep Staley beyond this year, you really have to wonder, just when are the Chargers ever going to get serious about competing? Especially when you have names available like Sean Payton and Ben Johnson, and you look at the coordinators in Philadelphia, you look at D'Amico Ryans as a defensive-minded head coach. But Payton and Johnson in particular, they're both equipped to elevate a young quarterback. Why continue down this path with a defensive-minded head coach in Brandon Staley who has clearly regressed? whose decision-making has clearly cost you in big games, clearly held you back in the postseason. When you look at having two top-tier offensive-minded head coaches available, why wait to move on from Staley? If not now, when? And if you have already moved on from Joe Lombardi, which they did, they fired him on Tuesday, if you're looking to replace him, you need to find an offensive coordinator who can come in and mold a young quarterback. And I think two names really come to mind here. You think about two names that could be the next offensive coordinator of the Chargers. One is Frank Reich, and one is Eagles quarterback coach Brian Johnson. They both have a track record of working with young quarter. They both have a track record of developing and working with young quarterbacks. And you look at Frank Reich, he was part of that staff in 2017 that turned Carson Wentz into an MVP candidate before he got hurt late in the season. And eventually, the Eagles went on and won a Super Bowl with Nick Foles. You look at Brian Johnson and what he's been able to do working alongside Jalen Hurts. And I know that Jalen Hurts has the work ethic and the drive and the desire to get better year by year and week by week. But when you look at Jalen Hurts, he has been a legitimate MVP candidate the entire season. And I think that you can't overlook. Johnson's hand in helping develop Jalen Hurts and helping him reach that level of play and that level of consistency. So whether it's Brian Johnson or Frank Reich, I think both could really elevate Herbert into that next stratosphere. And even if you're keeping Brandon Staley as head coach, either one of those guys as an offensive coordinator, you could really see the Chargers take a step forward in spite of Brandon Staley. And because of Justin Herbert and their work developing him, that's what I think the potential is there if you make the right hire for the Chargers. I think that they, with Herbert and with the right offensive mind, they could be a team that knocks on the Super Bowl door every year. But speaking of the Chargers, and more importantly, speaking of the team that beat them on Saturday night, that team that overcame five turnovers and a 27 to nothing deficit, yeah, the Jacksonville Jaguars, that's who I'm talking about here, they're for real. 
and the Jacksonville Jaguars are here to stay. And I'd like to become the first to welcome the Jacksonville Jaguars into the upper echelon of the AFC Pantheon because they've arrived. That's where they belonged. The Jaguars are now alongside the Kansas City Chiefs, the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Buffalo Bills. That's where the Jaguars reside in the AFC and in the NFL. They're here to stay. This is a dynamic and talented young team with a legitimate franchise quarterback who you saw can overcome all the adversity in the world. Didn't face a lot of it at Clemson. He sure did on Saturday night. Just think about what he had to overcome. Just think about the moxie that it takes to come back from throwing four interceptions, a 27-7 to halftime deficit, and then come out in the second half and pass for 211 yards and three touchdowns in the second half. Just think about that. Sure, the Chargers imploded like the Hindenburg. Sure, that, that happened too, and that definitely helps. And their offense turtled up, and they couldn't get anything going. I get all that. But when you look at the Jacksonville Jaguars, they have a franchise quarterback, they have a championship pedigreed Super Bowl winning head coach, and a young defense that's loaded with star power, loaded with talent at all three levels, defensive line, linebacker, the secondary, all of it. More on that a little bit later. But I actually think people are being a little foolish to write off the Jaguars against the Chiefs this weekend in Arrowhead. Because I, I know the Chiefs are this juggernaut. I know that Patrick Mahomes is probably going to wind up running away with the MVP award, as he should. Probably his most impressive season to date in a really impressive career so far. But Jacksonville's plus five turnover ratio is nothing to shake a stick at. That's seventh best in the NFL. And Kansas City enters with a minus three turnover ratio. And in the NFL postseason, turnovers are typically game killers, especially when you ta start talking about turning the ball over as a favorite and letting a talented team that might be the underdog that feels like it's playing with house money, who could that be describing? Letting teams like that hang around and hang around, you're playing with fire. And I think there's a chance that's the kind of game the Jaguars can kind of lull the Patriot. And that's the kind of game that I think the Jaguars can kind of lull Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs into. And Jacksonville's going to throw the kitchen sink at Patrick Mahomes. And make no mistake about it, you watch Patrick Mahomes, he's going to make five, six, seven circus-like plays per game. He's going to make your eyes pop out of your head. You're so impressed by what he can do. But there's always those one or two mistakes in big spots that prove costly when it comes to Patrick Mahomes. And I think the Jaguars are the type of team that can force those mistakes and make them pay for them, as we saw a little bit on Saturday night. But regardless of what happens on Saturday afternoon, the Jaguars have the youth, the talent, and the coaching to be in the mix for the AFC title for years to come. I think we're going to watch over the next two or three years the Jaguars become what we've seen the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals develop into. I think they have a lot of the same characteristics, great coaching, dominant defense, and a lot of young talent on offense around legitimate franchise quarterbacks. But right now the team that I think is the most complete in the playoffs and has the best chance to come out of the AFC – and make a run at the Super Bowl, and make a run at hoisting the Lombardi for the first time, is the Cincinnati Bengals. Especially after watching what that defense did to Taylor Huntley and the Baltimore Ravens on Sunday night, Logan Wilson is an anchor in that Bengals defense. He's still an elite linebacker. Sam Hubbard is always around the football, as you saw on that 98-yard fumble return for a touchdown, and the Bengals are just as dangerous and explosive as they've ever been. And a lot of that is because of Joe Burrow. Now, I know that Burrow wasn't the catalyst necessarily for the Bengals' offense on Saturday night. He only threw for 209 yards. But he's got to be pumped up to be playing any defense, not named the Baltimore Ravens this week. And I look at Joe Burrow's potential against the Buffalo Bills, a Bills team that really struggled and was lucky to get away with one against the Miami Dolphins. I really think that Burrow has the chance to go out and throw for 325 yards and two or three touchdowns. Because listen, I watched that game on Sunday. I'm sure you did too. I thought the Bills looked really shaky. And I thought Buffalo really benefited def defensively from Mike McDaniel's inability to get a play call into backup quarterback Skylar Thompson, especially on that critical fourth and one call late in the game. I, I look at the way that the Dolphins mismanaged the second half of that game as big of a reason for the reason they lost as the Bills doing anything to beat them, especially late. And you need to play a lot better than that if you're going to hold down Joe Burrow and that Bengals offense. And I think this has a chance to be a signature performance for Burrow against the Buffalo Bills.
because prior to Sunday, Burrow had thrown at least two touchdowns every week dating back to Thanksgiving. The Bills have given up 220 yards last week to Skyler Thompson. Skyler Thompson. What is Joe Burrow going to do against that team? I think he lights them up. I really do. And it could become a shootout. I mean, obviously, you look at the Bills, you look at Josh Allen, just playing in a different stratosphere offensively for most of this season. And they have weapons on weapons in Buffalo. But so do the Bengals. And I think that the Bengals, though, are good enough on, on defense. They're much better defensively than the Miami Dolphins are. And they're equipped to make the Bills pay for any mistakes they do make in a way that the Dolphins just weren't able to. So I think it's going to be a great game. I can't wait for it. I think it's going to be an offensive shootout. I think that the Bengals' defense and Joe Burrow are going to be the biggest difference in that game. And if they are, and if they do win that game, then I look at maybe you have to start looking at the Bills just a little bit differently because that's a really talented team on both sides of the ball. But I look at them, and I think the Bengals are better. I think they're more complete. And I think that Joe Burrow is a better quarterback right now than Josh Allen is. So it's going to be a great game. But the game of the weekend, that's going to be Eagles-Giants in Philadelphia at the link in front of what is going to be a raucous Philadelphia primetime crowd. No doubt about that. And what has me most excited about this game is it's round three of an NFC East rivalry. Just look at the divisional games that we saw on Wild Card Weekend. Bills and Dolphins, fantastic. ravens Bengals went down to the wire, went down to a Hail Mary that very nearly sent the game to overtime. And if John Harbaugh had the guts, maybe even going for two to try to win the game. That was a great game too. And I see no reason why this Eagles-Giants game will be any different than those divisional matchups this week in the divisional round. Because I don't think the Giants are the more talented team. I think that goes without saying. The Eagles have the better roster. They have the better quarterback. They certainly have the deeper receiving core, the better offensive line. Defensively, the secondaries are probably close, but I think the Eagles front seven is better. It's certainly deeper. It's maybe the deepest defensive line that we've seen in the NFL in the last three to five years. So what the Giants do have that the Eagles might not at the moment is they're healthy. And that matters. When you go into a playoff game with only a handful of players or less on your projected injury report on Tuesday during a walkthrough, that's a huge asset for you. That's a huge asset going into the second round of the playoffs to be the healthier team. And for the Eagles, we've talked about this before. They absolutely need Jalen Hurts to be 100% healthy and 100% effective in this game if they're going to advance on Saturday night. Because Philly better be careful here. Because when you watch Daniel Jones, he's playing the best football of his career. He had the strongest performance of his entire career in the biggest, most important, most clutch moment of his career last week in Minnesota, passing for 301 yards with two touchdowns, no picks, most importantly there, on the road in a loud and hostile environment. What I think is most impressive and maybe arguably second most important for this Giants team is Brian Dable has his team believing and really bought in that every time they step on the football field that they can win. And why would you believe that the way they're playing? They're playing with house money right now. Nobody expected the Giants to be here. Nobody expected the Giants to be in the divisional round to have won a playoff game going on the road to Minnesota and taking care of business, but they did. They're bought in. And the problem for the Giants is that when Jalen Hurts is healthy, he's the runaway MVP. I take the Eagles offense over the Vikings offense every day of the week, even with Justin Jefferson in a Minnesota uniform. It's just a matter of whether or not Jalen Hurts is the Jalen Hurts that we saw from weeks one through 10, or the Jalen Hurts who's still feeling the lingering effects of the shoulder injury. If he's not 100% healthy, look out because Kayvon Thibodeau and Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams just in the front seven, they can be a menacing group. And, and we saw that the Eagles just kind of got by even the Giants' backups in Week 18. The Eagles need Jalen Hurts to be fully healthy and effective, and that means the full playbook, the full running game, the, the ability to scramble, just being healthy and being effective is going to be most important for the Eagles because if they're not, and if the offense can't get the momentum going, if they're not able to get A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith going over the top, then guess what? The Giants' offensive line with an all-pro left tackle and Andrew Thomas 
And Evan Neal, who was one of the more dominant offensive tackles in the wild card round of the playoffs, they're good enough with Saquon Barkley right now where they can shorten the game. They can run the ball down your throats. They can play ball control. They can keep your offense off the field, especially if your offense isn't firing on all cylinders. And, and that's where they can grind out an upset. Ultimately, though, I think the Eagles' talent and Jalen Hurts' ability, I think that rises to the moment and rises to the occasion. I think the Eagles are the more talented football team. And at the end of the day, momentum is nice. Health really matters. But talent wins you games this late in the year in the postseason. And the Eagles have the more talented roster. I think it's closer than people think. I mean, this feels like a game that comes down to the last possession. Maybe Jalen Hurts drives them down the field and the Eagles win 20-17. to 17. Or it's like a 24 to 21 game. I think it's a field goal either way. I don't think this is a blowout on either side. Teams are too evenly matched. And the Giants are playing too well, too consistently right now. It's going to be a great game. And speaking of the Giants, let's give out the Lombardo Trophy, the MVP of Wild Card Weekend. In my opinion, there's only one real choice here, and it's Saquon Barkley. You'll get Saquon Barkley in Minnesota on Sunday afternoon. He exploded in his NFL playoff debut, rushing for 53 yards and two touchdowns. He added five catches on six targets for 56 yards. And while the numbers weren't necessarily eye-popping, Barkley's 28-yard touchdown run, where he was untouched, set the tone for the Giants' offense, and he was instrumental in shortening that game. And watching Barkley's effect on that game in Minnesota, just how vital he was to the Giants' playoff win, I really believe that if Dave Gettleman was a halfway competent roster builder, the people would have looked at Saquon Barkley as the number two pick in 2018 a lot differently than they do. In just that one playoff game, Barkley showed his value in a postseason setting against the Vikings. He showed just how impactful of a player he is, just how dominant he is, and just how much attention that a defense has to play to him on every single snap. In a limited workload, he only had nine carries and six targets. If the Giants make Saquon Barkley the focal point of their game plan on Saturday night, which they absolutely should, against an Eagles defense that's allowing 121 rushing yards per game, look out. That's the recipe for the upset. Nevertheless, Saquon Barkley brings home the Lombardo Trophy as the wild card MVP. Now let's move to the pick of the week. Let's look ahead to the NFC divisional round, but I don't think that's where the pick of the week comes from. It's on the AFC side, on the AFC bracket. Last week we had the Giants. So if you were riding with us last week, congratulations. Hope you made some money. You're welcome. And remember, as always, if you're riding with me on the pick of the week, go to FanDuel.com. Open up the FanDuel Sportsbook app, make your pick for the week, and screenshot your betting slip. Tweet it at me. I'll retweet it. We'll mention you on the podcast next week. But the pick of the week this week, and I know people are going to give me some flack for this one. I can see it coming already. But my pick of the week, it's the Jacksonville Jaguars, plus eight and a half. That number is just screaming at me, upset potential. And again, we don't go for wins with the pick of the week. We go for covers. And for some reason, my upset antenna have been going wild looking at this game and looking at this matchup. Because listen, I have this sneaky suspicion that Doug Peterson is going to have his team ready to play. That Trevor Lawrence isn't going to make the same kind of mistakes early that he made last week at home against the Los Angeles Chargers. I don't think you're going to see those interceptions early in the game. I think you're going to see Trevor Lawrence come out hot, come out firing, and, and looking to build on the momentum from a week ago. And again, we mentioned the plus five turnover ratio. That's huge. But the Jaguars have now won six straight, and they're playing great football on both sides of the ball that's eerily reminiscent to how the Bengals made their run to the Super Bowl last season. You think about Joe Burrow taking over games late. You think about the turnovers the defense forced, especially in the wild card round against the Raiders. It's a very similar blueprint that the, the Jacksonville Jaguars seem to be following. And that Bengals team went into Arrowhead and knocked off the Chiefs in the AFC title game last year. I don't think it's all that different to think that the Jaguars, with Trayvon Walker and Josh Allen on defense, and an offense that has Christian Kirk and Zay Jones and Marvin Jones Jr. and an emergent, finally emergent Evan Ingram making plays all over the field, can't go in there and force enough mistakes by the Chiefs offense to create more opportunities for Trevor Lawrence and that Jaguars offense to get the job done. Listen, I don't know that they're going to pull off the upset, 
but I love them at eight and a half. And I think they have the chance to win the game outright. So my pick of the week, the Jaguars plus eight and a half. This has been a really fun show. Thanks to Thomas Darrow, as always, behind the glass. Thanks to Mina Kimes for dropping by. But before we get out of here, we mention it every week, how much those five-star reviews really help grow the show. Well, we got one this week. It's from hashtag bananas and gas. The headline is outstanding, five stars. Matt does a great job all around. Top-tier guests at pivotal times. And the podcast gives a great glimpse into the behind the scenes of the NFL on a week-to-week basis from the player's perspective. So thanks for the five-star review. If you want to hear your review read on the air next week, leave us that five-star review. We'll read it on the air and we appreciate them. And thank you so much. Go ahead and subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store, Spotify, SoundCloud, Spreaker, all your favorite podcast platforms. Toss us a like on YouTube. You can check me out on Twitter at Matt Lombardo NFL. Enjoy Divisional Weekend. This is one of the best weekends on the sports calendar. Certainly one of the best NFL weekends of the year. Can't wait for the matchups. Can't wait to break them all down with you next week on the Matt Lombardo Show. I'll talk to you then.